Hi everyone, I'm Alex Bullen. I'm here with Boulder Digital Arts to teach you how to use a sound mixer. Now, a lot of filmmakers have come to me asking how they can better master their sound. So what do you do whenever you need to record two, three, four or more microphones at a time? You don't want to use a boom. Well, one of the best ways that you can control multiple sources of sound is by using a sound mixer. So let's take a look at this Mackie 1402, which is a pretty standard sound mixer. Um, we'll, we'll explore the different kinds of inputs, the different kinds of outputs, how you can watch the different leveling meters to make sure that you don't overdrive any of your signals, and how you can control your EQ to minimize too much bass, too much hissy sibilance, not enough punch in your sound, and other common sound issues that come up as you're working in post-production and as you're trying to get the best signal possible. Mixers come in, in two different flavors. They come in powered and unpowered. And this is important to keep in mind because many sources of sound, different kinds of microphones, need what's called phantom power. Um, so before you record anything, you need to make sure that your microphones are either powered or unpowered. I have with me today this condenser microphone, which is a, a pretty common, pretty industry standard Audio-Technica microphone. The brand isn't important. What is important is that it's a condenser microphone and it requires the use of phantom power. So if I had five or six of these microphones that I was using, they all need phantom power, but my mixer doesn't provide phantom power, I wouldn't have any sound. So it's incredibly important that you know whether or not your microphones need power before you get a mixer and before you start mixing your sound. We'll talk more about phantom power as we explore the back panel, but just make sure to keep that in mind as you select your microphones and as you select your mixer. Um, a sound mixer is called a mixer because it allows you to mix different sources of sound. It allows you to have multiple microphones, multiple sound inputs, recording and playing at the same time. Now this is important because with your video camera only having a couple of inputs, um, it's, that's pretty limiting as far as what you can film, what you can record, and what you can capture at any given time. Room sound and having, having microphones to capture the room tone doesn't always work very well. You get a lot of sound bouncing off the walls. You can have ambient noise from machinery, road noise, weather noise. So by using a mixer and going directly from microphones into this machine, you can get a lot cleaner signal, you can get a lot better sound, and at the end of the day you'll have a lot better results and you'll be more satisfied with your project. So let's take a closer look at one of the most important sections of a mixer, the master volume control. Every mixer is going to have a master volume control. On this particular mixer, it's called main mix. Other terms you'll see for it are master volume, master gain, um, main gain, or some combination of these words. The master volume, or the main mix in this case, essentially controls the end volume of all of your sound sources put together. It's important to keep a close eye on your master volume control because this is where a lot of unwanted distortion can accidentally be included in your signal. Now, if you think about a traffic light, green means go, Yellow means slow down, and red means stop. Many mixers, including this one, use a similar color coding system to, to tell you when your signal is clean, when your signal is starting to be pushed, and when your signal is overdriving. Overdriving and distortion are two terms that mean a similar, similar thing. It's unwanted sound that often comes in the form of hissing, crackling, or just unpleasant noise that you know shouldn't be there. So as you adjust your volume control, and in this case your master volume control, you need to keep an eye on your, on your green light, your yellow light, and your red light. And any time you see a red light, you need to stop. You need to adjust your volume control or do another take. Because once you get in the red, that means you've introduced unwanted distortion and overdrive, you're overdriving your signal. This is not good. This is not something that you can take out in post-production there are certainly some tools that allow you to minimize distortion and other unwanted overdriving artifacts in your sound, 
but those often come at a cost of reducing the quality of your overall sound. And that's not what you're after. You're after clean, quality, good sound. That's why you're using a mixer. So keep an eye on your master volume control. Stay out of the red. It's, it's much easier to bring a quiet signal up to level in post-production than it is to eliminate unwanted distortion and overdriving artifacts in your sound. Now, most master volume controls will have numbers alongside. The number you're looking for is zero. Zero is like an equilibrium of sound. On this particular mixer, Mackie's chosen to use the letter U. And this refers to a term they call unity gain. Now, what that means is not so important as, as it is to understand that unity gain or level zero is basically your baseline. This is your, your average volume, the place where you want to start. Now, the numbers alongside this master volume control are decibel numbers. So on this particular mixer, and a lot of mixers, have the ability to give you extra sound and to, to take the volume down. These numbers on this, on this particular master volume control you can go 5 decibels or 10 decibels above unity gain or your zero level, your baseline volume level. In addition to being able to boost the sound, you can reduce the overall sound by 5 decibels, 10 decibels, and then increments of 10. It's, it's a logarithmic scale, so the more you turn it down, the higher proportion that it turns the volume down by. Now a really good rule of thumb to follow is to start low and move your volume control up. And keep an eye on whatever corresponding color code you have on your mixer, because most mixers have a green, a yellow, and a red light somewhere. It may be one light, it may be a series of lights. Um, but start low and work your way up. Keep an, keep an eye on your signal. Um, having your actors or your source of sound speak or convey the sound as loud as they're going to be um, throughout the performance, throughout the speech, or whatever it is you're recording. That way you can find the maximum volume level and adjust your, your master volume control so that you get good, clean, powerful signal, but you stay well away from the red. You never want to go in the red. Now mini mixers, in addition to having a master volume control, have an additional volume control. On this particular mixer, this additional volume control is labeled as control room slash phones. Phones being short for headphones. As we'll see in a moment, we have some other output controls um, and sets of speakers that we can send the sound to other than just our main mix. So these, these different sources of sound, these different outputs have individual volume controls. And this is really helpful if you're filming and you want to be listening to headphones to monitor the mix, or perhaps you're in another room, you're in a control room type of situation, and the actors or the speakers are on the other side of a wall, on the other side of a pane of glass, and you can't accurately hear what's going on. These alternate volume controls allow you to route the sound to headphones or to another pair of speakers in another room, or perhaps um, in another part of the room. Similar to our main mix, we have a unity gain, also known as level zero, and we have decibel readings on the side that allow you to boost the signal above unity gain or to reduce the signal. It's a good rule of thumb to start with the volume very low and to work your way up. Now this is particularly important when you're wearing headphones because too much sound on a pair of headphones can cause great damage to your hearing, sometimes even permanent hearing loss, and nobody wants that. So, particularly if you're using headphones, make sure to follow this rule. Start with your volume level low and work your way up until you can hear it, hear it fine. Now, your powered mixers will often have an LED indicator that show you whether or not your phantom power is um, is enabled. In this particular mixer, our phantom power is right above our control room and our headphone volume control. 
When phantom power is enabled, the light will be on. When phantom power is disabled, the light will be off. And again, it's really important to know whether or not you need phantom power before you set up all your equipment and before you start recording and before you hook things up. This particular mixer with its multiple outputs, its alternate and its main mix, it has a couple of buttons here like most mixers will have that have multiple, multiple outputs um, that allow you to select the source of your control room. I'll show you what I mean. If this simply was a headphone volume control, you wouldn't need to select the source. Your headphones, your headphone volume would be controlled by this volume control. But a lot of mixers have more capabilities than that. You can listen to headphones, you can have your main mix, you can have an alternate pair of speakers, sometimes multiple alternate pairs of speakers. And if that's the case with your mixer, then you'll use a source control similar to what we have here to select whether you want this secondary volume control to be coming from your tape outputs, your alternate outputs, or your main mix. Which allows you to assign your alternate output into your main mix. This is again a place where you need to be careful if your mixer has a similar function because you're at a, you have a danger of, of creating a feedback loop where you have sound going in and sound going out and it creates that really high-pitched type of noise which is not only unpleasant, it's very loud, it overdrives your signal and it throws everybody off their game. So if you have an assigned to main mix function on your mixer, be very careful when you, when you punch it. Don't just play around with the button, make sure you know exactly where you're routing your sound. So now let's take a look at our individual channel strips. Now this is where, for a lot of people, a mixer gets a little bit overwhelming. And even for me, as an experienced sound person, I get overwhelmed when I go to an unknown mixer and I see all these knobs. What do they do? How do I control them? It is a bit overwhelming, but by looking at one individual channel strip, we can make it a lot simpler to understand. So what I've done is I've covered up with a binder here all the channels except for channel one. And most mixers, their channel strips are going to be oriented in a vertical fashion. So if we think about it as a vertical line, compartmentalize it, it can be a lot easier to get into it. Let's start at the top. Most mixers will have multiple kinds of inputs for your sources of sound. Now if you're working with microphones, you're probably going to be dealing with XLR inputs. I have here an XLR cable. This is what the input looks like. And if I were to be hooking it up to this microphone, I would simply line up the three pegs with the three holes. Voila. So to hook this microphone into the mixer, I would use this same XLR input. Now most mixers offer you functionality as far as what kind of inputs you use. So not every microphone is going to have an XLR input. Granted, 99% of them will, but every now and then you'll have a microphone or a microphone cable that has this quarter inch input. Many mixers will allow you to use whichever one you have. So you'll simply take your quarter inch input or rather your quarter inch cable and put it in your quarter inch input. Now on the mixer this is labeled as mic one and line in one. Mic and line are two different kinds of inputs that allow us to connect different sources of sound. Now many mixers also have what's called a low cut. Now we're starting to get into the EQ section of the mixer. We have three main spectrums within our sound, within the Within the realm of human hearing, we traditionally call them lows, mids, and highs. Now lows pose some issues for, for filmmakers and people recording sound. Lows sound great when you're bumping music in your car, when you have explosions and other sound effects in a big theater, but a lot of times lows get in the way of your sound. You know, the, the human ear can hear down to 24 hertz or so but a lot of this low sound is more felt than heard. And in terms of our sound waves, the lower the sound, the longer the wave. So 
low sounds might be, the sound wave might be four or five feet wide bouncing around the room, it just muddles up your sound. So we can use this low cut button to eliminate a lot of our low end right off the bat. Now this is a good function to have enabled by default. Unless you know you need the super low end, it's a good idea to just have your low cut on, especially when you're recording vocals and other kind of dialogue. Low end in the human voice doesn't really have any information that we need, but it does have sound and it does muddy up the rest of your signal. So you'll find that by using a low cut function or simply reducing the low frequency in your sound, in your dialogue sound, your dialogue is instantly cleaner. It's a great trick and it's really easy to use. This particular low cut is located at 75 hertz, which is about where the speakers stop vibrating and the subwoofer takes over. A subwoofer is a special kind of speaker that only produces sub frequencies, hence the name subwoofer, and this low cut will eliminate anything that would be playing by the subwoofer. You don't want actor dialogue coming through the subwoofer, you want it coming through the speakers and being very clean, and very powerful. So this low cut allows you to easily clean up your sound. A lot of mixers, in addition to having a volume control, which we'll get to in a moment, have what's called a gain control. This is essentially a second volume control for your channel strip. A good rule of thumb with this gain control, if you don't really know what to do with it, is similar to the rule of thumb for the main volume control. You want to start low and gradually move up until you have your desirable sound. If you move your gain too high, you risk introducing unwanted distortion and overdriving your signal, which again is nearly impossible to take out in post-production without compromising the sound. So pay careful attention to your gain control. Keep it low unless you need to turn it up and you'll be very pleased with your volume results. On this particular mixer, the gain control is called trim. Trim and gain and volume are often used interchangeably, so just keep an eye out for whichever, whichever one your mixer refers to it as. So that covers our, our input section. Let's take a closer look at our EQ section. Many mixers have three band EQ, and this basically means that it splits up the EQ band EQ standing for equalizer, into three sections, lows, mids, and highs. Highs are responsible for hissy sounds, for tinny sounds, for the sibilance that comes with S sounds, S, T sounds, T, P sounds, P, and other hard consonant sounds. These sounds can be frustrating, but by controlling our level of high frequency, using this high EQ knob, we can control the sibilance and keep it at a manageable level. We don't want to keep the high frequency too low though, because if it's too low, it's very muffled, it's very boxy, it doesn't sound very good, it's quite unintelligible. So keep a close eye on your high frequency so that you can have a good mix of presence and bite, but not too much so that you're introducing unwanted sibilance. Next is our mid. Our mid frequency is where the vast majority of our interesting sonic information is found. This mid frequency controls around 2500 hertz and the human voice is located mostly around 7000 hertz. So our mid frequency controls our human voice and most of the sound effects that make it to the human ear and, um, and are clear within our minds. Too much mids can make a really honky, unpleasant sound. Too few mids can result in a really weak sound. So while you want to be able to tame your highs, you also want to be able to have the right amount of mids so that your sound sounds normal. The mid control is really what's responsible for whether your film and your audio sounds like real life. So pay close attention to your mid control. Last is our low control. Now we talked a little bit about the low control when we looked at our low cut, which is a function that many mixers have, cutting off frequencies from 75 hertz and below, which is where speakers stop playing the sound and your subwoofer takes over. The low frequency control has a really similar function. 
except instead of on and off, like the low cut has, simply being a button on the mixer, the low control is linear. So you can add or subtract increments of lows from your source of sound. With dialog, it's a really good idea to keep your lows low, if you will, and increase them as necessary. As we mentioned before, too much lows can really interfere with the sound, can, can muddle up the rest of the frequencies, and give you an unsatisfactory result. Now, of course, it would be too easy to simply turn the lows all the way off, because without any lows, there's no presence and, and boominess to male voices and other lower-pitched sound effects. Another thing to be aware of when you're dealing with the low frequency spectrum is that not all speakers are capable of playing these low frequencies. It's a terrible thing when you mix the lows too high in your signal simply because you couldn't hear them on your speakers. So make sure that when you're mixing your sound, your highs, your mids, and your lows, that you're doing so on a pair of speakers or a pair of headphones that you're familiar with and that you know has a full frequency range. Moving right along down the channel strip, we have a pan control. Now every mixer is going to have a pan control. At the very least, it'll have it on the main mix control, but most of them will have pan controls on the individual channels. Pan control stands for panoramic. So the pan control allows you to mix your signal from the left to the right or to keep it in the center. This is helpful when you're trying to give your sound a sense of space, a sense of where are things coming from. If you're having a conversation between two people on screen, perhaps you'll mix this actor to the right, this actor to the left. Your pan control allows you to do that. Many mixers will also have a mute control for your individual channels. This control does exactly what it sounds like it would do. It mutes that individual channel's sound. This is helpful when listening to playback of your mix, allowing you to isolate different sources of sound. And it's also helpful when monitoring. Continuing down, our final control is our volume control. Now, this is similar, set up in a similar way to our main mix control. We have unity gain, also known as zero, and we have a decibel scale along the side. This particular mixer allows you to boost the signal above unity gain and to cut it. Some mixers will, will only allow you to cut sound. But even though this mixer and many mixers allow you to boost the sound, try not to do that unless you absolutely have to. Because it, again, it can introduce unwanted distortion and unwanted overdriven artifacts in your sound. And a rule of thumb of volume mixing still applies with this individual channel mixing. You want to start low and bring it up to get your desired sound. And keep an eye on your main mixes red, green, and yellow color scale. A lot of mixers will have this same light scheme on the individual channels. Some mixers will have only a single LED diode to turn red whenever you're overdriving that particular channel. If you're red, you're dead. Try to stay out of the red at all costs because again, it's much easier to raise the volume level in post-production than it is to eliminate distorted artifacts in your sound that you've recorded. So let's take this binder away. And now we've got all 14 of our channels, each with their own individual set of inputs, EQs, and volume controls. And when we look at it this way, when we break it down into vertical strips, it's really not that complicated. If this was a 64 channel mixer and we had 64 vertical strips, we'd have the same basic functions for each channel strip. We'd have inputs, we'd have a gain control, we'd have EQ, and we'd have a final volume control, as well as a mute and a solo function sometimes. Now what I didn't mention are these two knobs called auxiliary. Now I've saved this for last within the channel section because it's a little bit more complicated and it's not something that most people use. However, if you want to fully understand a sound mixer, it's important to get a good grasp 
on the auxiliary function. Auxiliary functions have two roles. One is to allow you to monitor your mix. You know, if you think of, if you think of a band playing on stage, they often have speakers on stage that project the sound back at them. You know, I, I need more mix in my monitor. Auxiliary allows you to send sound to the people on stage or to, um, to the folks that are monitoring the sound. The second main function for auxiliary is to allow you to mix effects into your sound. So I've brought with me today a sonic maximizer. This particular rack mount unit is used to clean up some of the interplay between low and high frequencies. Now, a lot of people will use a similar unit to generally clean up their sound. So what you'll do with the auxiliary, which we'll talk about it more in a moment, is you'll hook up the inputs and the outputs from your effects unit into the sends and returns of your mixer. Send, return, and auxiliary all have something to do with each other. They're all related. Send is like your input for the effects box and return is the output. So the output of your effects box goes to your send. The input of your effects box goes to your return and you use this auxiliary control to control the amount of the effect that's being blended in. Now this is a bit convoluted, a bit hard to understand at times. Another, another term for this is wet and dry. If something is referred to as wet, it's fully saturated in the effect. So in order to get a wet effect, you would turn your auxiliary knob all the way up to have a more dry effect, you would turn it down. A couple of good starting points for these channel strips is to have your auxiliaries turned all the way down to zero, your gain turned to about only a quarter of the way up, your EQs straight up at 12 o'clock, which will give you the most natural sound to start out with, your pan also at 12 o'clock, which will put your, source, your sound signal right in the middle, and your volume control somewhere in the lower region so that way you can mix it up to your desired volume level. A lot of mixers don't have XLR inputs for every single channel. And this mixer is a great example of, of, of this kind of setup where we only have six XLR inputs and then these remaining channels have quarter inch inputs. This is mostly a design choice. These other, other channels are no less functional than the channels with XLR and microphone inputs However, they are limited to, uh, to quarter inch inputs, to line inputs. Um, line and quarter inch are used interchangeably. And these channels often have, have, a, have, a, have a bonus functionality to them. You can send in stereo sources of sound, which might come in handy if you have dual microphone setups or other multiple other stereo sources of sound. So next, let's take a look at our stereo auxiliary return and our inputs and outputs here in the upper section. We're doing great. We've made it through about 80% 80, 80 of our mixer. I hope you're following along and you're learning how to use a mixer well. So let's take a look at one of our last sections of the front panel of the mixer. This section I like to call the bells and whistles section. A lot of mixers have extra functions Beside your, your necessities, your, your necessary volume control, gain control, EQ control, pan control, inputs and outputs. A lot of mixers have extra inputs and outputs that you can use for different kinds of functions. So let's take a closer look. A lot of mixers will have your sends and returns, which have to do with our auxiliary control. This is where we would send our signal to an effects unit and return it back to the mixer. Now, send and return do exactly what they sound like they would do. Send sends the signal to the effects box. It sends the signal to the input of the effects box. You manipulate your effects box however you want your effect to be set. And then you would 
connect your output of your effects box to your return of the mixer. So the mixer sends the signal to the effects box and then returns it from the effects box through the return input. A lot of returns will be in pairs. There will be two, two sets. This allows you to use stereo effects. Many effects come in stereo, chorus, reverb, some delays, and many higher level audio processing units allow you to process your effects in stereo. Whether or not you need stereo is up to you, but with a lot of effects box having the stereo capability, you may as well play with it and see which result you like more. As we mentioned before, this send and return function is controlled by the auxiliary knob. This auxiliary knob was found directly above the EQ knobs on this particular mixer, and in all mixers, it will be found on the individual vertical channel strip. Many mixers will have multiple sets of main outputs. In a moment, we'll take a look at the back panel of this mixer, which has a main output. And what you'll notice is that we also have a main output on the front of the mixer. Now, why in the world would we need two sets of main outputs? Well, a couple of reasons. One, as we'll see in a moment, the outputs on the back are XLR. They are this three-prong microphone output. The main outputs here are quarter-inch or line outputs. So no matter what kind of cables you're working with and what kind of speakers or recording setup or cameras you're working with, you can hook up your main outputs and go with it. Another thing to note is that line outputs are generally quieter in volume than XLR outputs. So if you have both options, both cables, and you find that you need a little bit of softer signal or a little bit of a hotter signal, hotter meaning louder, you have options as to whether or not you want to use quarter inch or XLR. Many mixers will also have a tape input and a tape output. And you'll notice that these out inputs and outputs are neither quarter inch nor XLR. So why is that? Well, the tape input and output is really a throwback to the days of tape recording machines. You would hook up your, your recording machine to the input, mix all your sound, how we've talked about, and send all that signal directly to a tape recording machine. Now, just because this is called tape input and output doesn't mean that you can only use tape recording machines. In fact, you can use this set of inputs and outputs to hook up any kind of sound recording device or output device. And it doesn't even need to be in RCA. In fact, you can get an adapter that translates RCA to eighth inch, eighth inch to quarter inch if you wish, quarter inch to XLR. Really, whatever kind of possibility you need, you can get an adapter for it. This extra set of inputs and outputs comes in handy in a couple of different scenarios. Say your mixer only has one main output, one source of sound, and it has these, this tape input and output. You can use the tape input and output to send your, mixed, your final mixed signal to whatever recording device you're using. You can also accept an additional source of sound in the event that you've filled up all the channels on your mixer and you need just one more source of sound. You can use the tape input to mix in that other source of sound. On a lot of mixers, you can use the tape input and output to provide intermission music. Say you're working with a live speaker, a panel discussion, and you're changing speakers, you're changing workshops, and you want to play some intermission music for the audience. You can use the tape input and output to hook up an MP3 player or a CD player, or whatever you're using to play your music, and then toggle your main output to go to the tape output instead. So that way, you don't have to mute all of your individual channels, you don't have to worry about microphone sound, you can simply switch over to the tape input and output and play some intermission music for your audience. So now, let's take a look at the back panel of this mixer. This back panel contains all of our outputs. 
And after all, what good would it be if we did all this work mixing the EQ and the gain and the volume level if we didn't send the signal anywhere? That would be silly. Now, most mixers, as they get bigger, as they add more and more channels, they'll have functionality on the back of the mixer. So definitely, no matter what mixer you have, take a look at the back and see what kind of controls and what kind of options you have on the back of your mixer. This particular mixer is a tabletop mixer, so it has a horizontal strip of controls on the back. Larger mixers have more vertical strips or stack horizontal strips on top of each other, but most medium-sized mixers will have a single horizontal strip of controls on the back. Of course, obviously, we have our power control. The mixer's not going to work at all if we don't plug it in. Next, we have our power switch. We need to plug it in. We need to turn it on. Just the basic to get it going, make all the stuff work. Next, we have our phantom power switch. Now, again, phantom power is a really big deal to know whether or not you need it for your microphones. You can find out this information by testing your microphones with phantom power on and off. You can also look at the manufacturer of the microphone's website and the owner's manual. Those are three ways that you can find out whether your particular microphones need phantom power. Now this mixer, being a, what's called a powered mixer, does have phantom power. And you can simply switch it on and switch it off. When phantom power is switched on, often there's an LED on the front of the mixer that will light up, letting you know that phantom power is on without you having to look at the back panel. When you're not using phantom power, it's a good idea to turn it off. Now that doesn't mean you need to be crazy about it. If someone takes a breath and you switch off the phantom power and then switch it back on. But do be mindful of when you have it on and when you have it off. It's sort of like a light bulb. It'll work longer and your mixer will use less power if you have phantom power off whenever you're not using it. Moving right along, here are our main outputs. Now in this case, these particular outputs are XLR. Again, our microphone three-prong type of cable. On the front of this mixer, we had an alternate pair of main outs, which were quarter inch, which looked like this, which looked like our line input. Many mixers will offer you the option to use either XLR, line, or both. And in this case, we have XLR outputs. Now you'll notice right below main right and main left, it says balanced. What does that mean? What does balanced mean? What does unbalanced mean? When can you use either one? Balanced essentially means that the cable is made in such a way so that it will cancel some of the ground noise and some of the interference that you sometimes get from cell phone waves going through your sound source and other sources of electrical interference. You know, sometimes when you need to move your cell phone away from your computer speakers or from your car speakers because you hear this sort of weird electrical noise, balanced cables attempt to use phasing, which isn't really important to understand, they attempt to use phasing to cancel out some of these sound frequencies. Now you can't just simply plug into a balanced input and expect your signal to be balanced. You need a special kind of cable. Cables will be labeled as either balanced or unbalanced. And it's important to make sure that you have balanced cables if you need balanced cables. A situation where you would need to have balanced cables is one where you have perhaps a lot of fluorescent lights or other electrical devices going on in the same room. Or maybe the power supply for the building or the site where you're filming doesn't have a, a really clean signal. A lot of this can depend not on the building itself, but on the municipality. Ground noise and, and this sort of electrical interference in the electrical current, it's not something you have a lot of control over unless you have a dedicated gener generator, an electrical engineer, or some kind of expertise to be able to figure out what your power signal is like. That's why we have balanced cables, is, is an attempt to cancel out these, these electrical interferences and not have them introduced into your signal. Because similar to distortion, Similar to overdrive, if you have electrical interference in your signal and you get a sort of sound, there's not a lot you can do about it in post-production. So sometimes it's good to just nip it in the bud before it happens. Now, you don't always need balanced cables. It sure sounds good to 
be able to prevent sound, unwanted sound in the first place. But in 90% of my work, I don't use balanced cables and I get a clean sound. It's, it's something that if you know about it, you'll need to prevent it. Um, it's good to have some balanced cables just in case, but it's not something that you need to strictly adhere to out of worry of sound. Mixers with multiple output options similar to this mixer will have our other outputs. On this particular mixer, it's labeled as control room. So if you recall, on the front panel, we had our main mix control and then our control mix control, our control room control, rather. These two volume controls were responsible for the individual output volumes. So the main mix controlled the volume of the main output, and the control room volume controlled the volume of the control room output. And here on this back panel is where we would plug in our speakers, our recorders, or whatever destination that our sound is going to. Mini mixers have more than two options for your outputs. On this particular mixer, we have what's called an alternate 3-4 output. The numbers aren't really important. What is important is alternate and output. These two jacks, they're line outputs, quarter inch outputs. They send your sound to another source. And as you'll note in very fine print, it says BAL slash UNBAL. And this stands for balanced or unbalanced. These particular outputs can be balanced or unbalanced. These mains that we just looked at only say balanced. So these are going to put out a balanced signal. Some of the inputs or outputs on your mixer may say balanced, they may say unbalanced, they may say both. They may not say anything. If it says balanced, it's a good bet to go with balanced. If it says unbalanced, it's a good bet to go with unbalanced cables. If it doesn't say anything, you can likely use either. And if it says both, you can use either. Now, mini mixers will have what are called channel inserts. Now, these, these jacks allow you to hook up an effect box similar to the Sonic Maximizer we looked at earlier, but with a slight difference from how we used it with the aux control. Now, if you recall, our auxiliary control was a knob that allowed us to blend in the effect. We had our dry signal at zero, and then as we turned the knob clockwise, we blended the effect into the sound, creating a more wet sound. These channel inserts play a really similar role. They allow you to hook up an external effects box or audio processing unit to the mixer. However, unlike the auxiliary control, which allows you to blend in the sound, channel inserts put the full amount of the effect box sound into the channel. So what I mean by that is if I were to plug the Sonic Maximizer into the channel one insert, there would be no blending. The Sonic Maximizer would simply put all of its sound into channel one. Now these sound processing devices don't have sound of their own. They alter the sound that's being recorded or that's being mic'd. So by using these channel inserts, you can open up your sends and returns for other functions, your auxiliary knobs for other functions, and put the full amount of the effect on the channel. This is useful with compressors, with de-essers, with, with external EQ units, and with, with, um, with audio processing units like the Sonic Maximizer that balance out the signal. If you were using a de-esser, you'd probably want it to work to its full effect. Um, if that's not the case, then you'd want to hook it to the SIN in the return and use the auxiliary knob to blend it in. But if you want it to work to its full potential, then you would use the channel insert. Using the channel insert is really similar to having your effect box hooked up to the SIN in return and simply having the auxiliary knob up all the way. But by using the single jack of the channel insert, it simplifies things. You have less cables to mess with, you don't have to make sure that the knobs are in the right places, and it saves you setup and breakdown time. Mini mixers will offer you multiple channel inserts, channel one insert corresponding to channel one, channel two insert corresponding to channel two, and so on. Now this particular mixer only has six channel inserts. There are a couple reasons for this. One is that 
there's simply not enough room on this mixer to include a channel insert for each channel. This mixer is 14 channels. So if we had channel inserts for every channel, the mixer would have to be another foot long. That increased the cost to the consumer, makes it heavier, makes it bulkier. And a lot of companies find that by offering multiple types of mixers, then customers can get the right kind of mixer for their situation, regardless of things like how many channel inserts they offer. It's, it's pretty rare to have an effect box on each channel insert. However, you might find that you need it. And again, at the end of the day, it's all about your ears. You can learn to use the technology and be proficient with it, but if it doesn't sound good, it doesn't sound good. So you have to trust your ears at the end of the day. I want to thank you for joining me on this talk. I'm Alex Bullen with Boulder Digital Arts. I hope you have a great day mixing sound.